lot of students have misconceptions about where charges come from and the fact that we can create this charge. That's not what's happening at all. So the first thing I want to point out to you is where the charges come from. Charges come from matter. I mean, if we weren't talking about charged objects, or we have objects, those objects are made out of matter, and the objects become charged because matter is actually transferred. The particular matter that I'm talking about are the particles, the subatomic particles of atoms, which all matter is made up of. So I've drawn here a picture of an atom. And it's got a nucleus, and it's got these things that look like it's going in orbits around it. Hopefully, your chemistry teacher, your physical science teacher taught you a little bit about atomic structure. What do we find in the nucleus of the atom? Starts with a pro, ends with a cons. Protons. So we have protons in the nucleus of an atom. And I want to represent plus, red, positive charges. We have protons in the, in the nucleus. But atoms normally are balanced by what? We don't have a bunch of charged atoms running around. They are neutralized by what? What's the other charged particle in an atom? Electrons. Negative electrons, which I've drawn as these green, these green things right here. So these charges isn't this mysterious ether of energy out there. They are actually bits and pieces of matter which have a charge themselves. We don't normally see those charges manifested in everyday life because everything is neutralized by these atoms. This desk doesn't have an overwhelming charge on it because it's made out of atoms that are neutral. They're happy. They have as many electrons as they have protons. The charges are in balance. There's no net difference. But in certain circumstances, like when you have friction, and I'm literally schlepping off electrons. I'm literally plucking electrons. I'm literally plucking electrons off of these atoms. So when I say I have a negative charge, that means I have an abundance of these little critters. Electrons. Electrons are the negative charges. If I pull an electron away from an atom, the thing that I have left behind is an ion. Hopefully you learned that in chemistry class, what an ion is. An ion is an atom, it just has an imbalance of charge. There are positive ions and there are negative ions. We call the, the positive ions cations because they're positive. They're positive. They have had an electron stripped away, so now they have more positive protons than negative electrons, and so they're positive. So that cations are positive. Positive ions. Cations. So the charges themselves is actually an electron makes up a negative charge, is, an is, is a negative charge, and a positive charge is a positive ion. It's actual bits of matter. <coughs> That's what a charge is. Um, the law of charge is the way these things act, and in fact, the thing that keeps the electrons orbiting around, if you will, the central nucleus, the positively charged nucleus, is the fact that, what? The law of charges. Opposites attract, and like charges repel. Right? That's what's happening in the atomic structure. The electrons are in orbit around the positive nucleus because of this attraction. The electrons don't collide with the nucleus because they're moving so fast. And then the smart guy in the class says, well, Mr. A, how come those positive charges are not repelling each other? And that's called the strong force. It's another force in physics. If we got into talking about nuclear physics, that's what we'd be talking about. Why? It has to do with the neutrons. It has to do with the neutrons. If there were not neutrons in the nucleus, then the protons would fly apart. But it has something to do with the neutrons. We don't talk about neutrons so much because neutrons don't have charge. They only add to the mass of the atom, but they really don't do anything electrically. They don't do anything chemically. They don't do anything chemically when we're talking about chemical reactions. So we don't talk about neutrons. 
So the law of charges, you've heard it time and time again, and some people try to apply this to personality. I really wonder. Do opposites really attract? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not lying. <laughs> that's, that's very cool advice. All right. Conservation of charge. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to keep going back to the atomic structure. I'm going to keep going back to. We are not creating these electrons. Those electrons are here. <laughs> these electrons are here already. They exist for our use. If we can control energy, then we can control and make our life better. That's what we're doing with most things that we do in life. We're controlling energy. We're controlling the location of that electron. We're separating the electron from the atom. We haven't created it. It's only a separation of charges. In simple terms, charge cannot be created or destroyed. destroyed. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. We just move it around. We just move it around. Okay. So point number three in all of this is the conservation of charge. We're just schlepping off electrons from the floor, transferring it into our body, and like tr John Travolta, we're going to use it to shock somebody. Right? You okay. shock the all right. Conductors and insulators. One of the worksheets. The mic picks up everything. I'm working on getting some wireless mics and a lapel so it doesn't pick up a lot, but it does. Conductors and insulators. There is a whole sheet trying to get you to understand what conductors and insulators are. Um, Conductors are metals and plasma and sometimes semiconductors. This is a conductor. This metal, the metal on this ring stand is a conductor. The plastic is an insulator. And the difference is, electrically speaking, that in metals, the charges are free to move around. The electrons can go up and down. If this were a radio antenna and we had a radio oscillator, we were transmitting a frequency, we would be literally slamming electrons up and down in this antenna. That's why antennas are long skinny things. In the plastic rod, the electrons are not, the electrons are not free to move around. That doesn't mean they won't take a charge. In fact, a metal conductor is less likely to take a charge because the charges are free to move around. But a plastic object or, gla uh, or glass will take on a charge. So when I'm rubbing, when I'm rubbing the wool onto the plastic, I'm rubbing off the electrons from the wool onto the plastic. But they're staying right there. If you could see them, there would be this halo. I'd have this magic wand. I could, I could draw with it. See <laughs> tracers like hallucinogenic patterns. Yep. Um, so, I want to give an example. Charged by friction while holding a plastic rod versus a metal rod. Charged by friction, I'm going to rub the wool onto the plastic rod, and I'm going to get a charge. If my thing was still standing up there, then, then we would see that this thing had a charge on it. The charge is just sitting right here. All right, predict what happens when I rub a metal rod on the wool. Does it take on a negative charge like the plastic rod? Does it take on a positive charge because it's different? Or does it take, take on any charge at all? Check your neighbor. It doesn't, here's, it's a trick question. Because I ha you have to say that you're holding on to the rod. And if you take a metal rod, yeah, metal rod. If you take a metal rod and you rub it on the wool, yes, you're rubbing off, you're rubbing off, you're rubbing off electrons onto the metal rod. But guess what? They go away right away because zzzz, it goes back to the, down to the ground. The Earth is the, when you ground a circuit. The Earth is this gigantic, enormous vat of atoms, right? Both positive charges and negative charges. 
If you ground anything, if that charge needs the positive charge to neutralize, then the positive charges are going to go to that object if you grounded it. If that, if you have a negative, if you have a positive charge and it needs to be neutralized by a negative charge, whatever it needs, the Earth is going to provide an unlimited supply of whatever those charges are. That's what you cause by grounding. If you short circuit in something in your house, bam! All of a sudden, all the juice that's being supplied to your house finds a path to ground. And you talk about current flow. It'll smoke the circuit. So, trick question. If you're grounding a metal rod, you're not going to build up a static charge on it. It won't be static anymore. Since it's free to move, it will move through the metal rod and find a path to ground. Okay. We just talked about, we just talked about uh, charge by friction. And as I, as I read this chapter, I'm learning when you, when you, with you guys. I'm reading this book and I'm learning with you guys. And I'm doing these experiments up here because I, it doesn't always make sense to me. It really does. And I hope that that provides some authenticity for you that I'm, I'm struggling with this too. I, it kept saying, okay, rub it with the wool, rub the plastic, rub the glass, what are the differences? And I'm like, okay, they're asking me to, they're asking me to predict this. And first it was a negative charge, but if I, so if I do it a different way, so it should be a positive charge, right? And I couldn't figure out Okay, what materials give a, give the plastic rod a positive charge, and what materials give the plastic rod a negative charge? I'm trying to wrap my head around this. It's really easier than that. So there was a question in your handout about that. The object that loses electrons takes on what charge? The wool, I've been telling you all along, that your wool sweater, your hair, your hair is a source of electrons, that if you take an insulator, rubber, rubber balloon, this is like different problem. If you take the balloon and you rub it on your hair, then electrons get schluffed off and deposited on the balloon. So the object that loses the electrons, my hair, what charge does my hair have now? If I've taken electrons and deposited from my hair and deposited them on this balloon, then what charge must my hair have? I've taken electrons away from my hair. So what's left behind is the positive ions. And if I do this enough, and my, it wasn't human or something like that, is my hair beginning to stick up? Okay, so this is what's happening with my hair. So now my hair is positively charged, and just like the electroscope, my hair starts to want to get away from the other pieces of hair, right? And all of a sudden, right? I got to do. So... The object that loses the electrons becomes positive, and the object that gains the electrons becomes negative. Becomes negative. So that should answer those type of questions. We got charge by by friction, charge by conduction, charge by induction. All these charges. Great. Hey, with charge by conduction, you have to have contact. Not necessarily friction. Not necessarily friction. But if I wanted to charge the oscope, if I wanted to charge the oscope, I take the wool, I deposit electrons on this plastic rod. They're not going anywhere because it's an insulator. I put them on the end. They're hanging out on the end. They're not conducting through me, through my body. They're just sitting there on the end. And then, to charge the oscope, then I take my magic wand and I touch it. And then there's the transfer of the electrons, the abundance of electrons on this wand down into the conductor and it makes the leaves spread apart. And I've charged this. But here's an interesting thought experiment. Take example a lightning strike. Is that charged by conduction? Does the cloud charge the earth, or whatever way you want to think about it, the earth charges the cloud when there's a lightning strike? You, you just said, Mr. A, there has to be contact. Remember what I said about conductors and insulators. You know what a plasma is? This is the fourth state of matter. You have solid liquid gas and plasma. Plasma is 
is atoms in a highly charged energy state where they've had electrons stripped away from them. So electrified air conducts electricity. Electrified air conducts electricity. Elec lightning is a plasma. So a lightning strike is charged by conduction because the plasma is the conductor. So there is a conduit between the cloud and the ground, and then the cloud is neutralized because it has a pathway to ground. Just something to keep in mind. Charged by conduction and charged by induction. This is probably one of the hardest things to get your head around. I had to draw a big picture for myself. And it really brings up everything that we've been talking about. So, Greg, and if you understand this, you're going to ace that 10 point quiz that you're going to take in just a few minutes. Take, uh, they talked about these pith balls, these pith balls. And what they are is they're, they're really lightweight balls made out of styrofoam material that, like, peanuts are made out of. Really lightweight stuff. And what they do is they spray paint them with some sort of a, some sort of a conducting paint so that the surface of the pith ball does conduct electricity. So imagine that they, that's what these are, these little pith balls. So here's a pith ball minding its own business. It has got both positive charges and negative charges. Here's a pith ball just minding its own business, step one. Now, step two, here comes this magic wand with negative charge on it. An abundance of negative charge. I've really rubbed it with the wool and it's really negatively charged. Okay? Now, the charges in this pit ball have nowhere to go except as far as they can away from the incoming and negative charge. Right? Incoming! Here comes this big thing. And they run to the other side of the pit ball. Right? They can't because the pit ball is conducting. So the negative charge runs over to this side of the ball, leaving the positive charges behind. The positive charges don't mind because, hey, it's negative. <laughs> Pretty excited about that. Right? All right, so in one sense of the word induction, you are inducing this polarization of charges in the pit ball. The problem is, is that once you take this external source away, the charges redistribute themselves in happy fashion. They, they go back to where they were normally once you take this rod away. So you can't induce a polarization of charges on this pit ball, but it's not going to stay that way if you take the external influence away. So what you have to do is step three. It's pretty tricky, pretty tricky. You've got your negative external source. It's still sitting there. The positives still want to be around where the negative presence is. But the negatives, they're getting the heck out of town. All of a sudden, you, that's what this symbol means, ground. You've connect, literally connected a wire from that pit ball to Mother Earth. A huge source of positive and, electro, and negative electrons, positive ions and negative electrons. So what you've done is you've given these negative electrons a path to get out of town. They were as far against the side of the pit ball as they could be. But now they went further, further, and they, they're hanging out down the ground. Hey, this is all right. right. Found myself a cold, dark place where I can hide out away, right, from the those. In the same way, positive electrons that are drawn to this negative wand here can come up through ground and go into the sphere. And what we've done now is we've created this sphere with only positive charges. All the negative ones have gone to heaven. Now, remove the ground, cut off the path of escape or entry into the castle. Remove the ground, isolating the positive charges on the pit ball. Now, mind you, you have to do that first before step five, you remove the external source of negative charge. And what you are left with, my friends, is a charged object which has been charged by induction. 